4 p.m. Um, Jake, should we get started? And Steve, are you good with that? I'm good with that. Yep. Right. We'll make cool. a slow start because people are going to be probably rolling in for a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. I think absolutely. Yep. We had a, a bunch of people register. Um, okay. Yes. So as you can see, we have people adding to the chat box where they're from and why they're interested in the topic. Um, and there may be their connection to Steve or um, to our area here, please feel free to do that. We'd love to see who is out there listening and watching. If you are new to our webinar series, this series is called Friends from the Field and it's co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, which is a community conservation organization for the Blue Hill Peninsula and Island Heritage Trust, which is a land trust for Deer Isle, Stonington and the surrounding islands. Um, and I normally forget to introduce myself, but I'm Lander and I work for Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And I'm gonna pass it over um, to Jake from Island Heritage Trust um, to do a little bit of tech help before I introduce Steve. Thanks Lander. And thank you guys so much for tuning in this afternoon from home. It's so great to have you here. Uh, the two features we're gonna be using today are the chat feature down on the center, bottom center of your screen. And you can feel free to ask your questions throughout the presentation, but we will save them for a Q&A segment at the end. Um, and when that time comes, you can click the raise your hand feature and then Lander will give you the option to ask your question with your own audio. Um, and if you don't feel like doing that, don't worry, just drop it in the chat box and Lander and I will comb through them the best we can and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And um, with that, I'll hand it back over for our formal introduction. Thank you so much, Jake. So we are super excited to have Steve Russell joining us tonight from College of the Atlantic. He has been a faculty member there since 1993 and teaches courses in vertebrate biology, environmental physiology, herpetology, winter ecology, and biological photography. He also served as director of the college's Natural History Museum until 2005. He has traveled extensively throughout the US, the Caribbean, and Central America for his research and has published in the Journal of Experimental Biology, Physiological and Biochemical Zoology, and Behavioral Ecology, and Sociobiology. We're super excited to have you here tonight, Steve. I'm gonna pass it over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And I just took a quick look at the chat and, and uh, hi to Anna and to Nancy and Mike Good. There's a couple of names that jumped out right away. Thanks for tuning in. It's kind of strange how this Zoom works, right? Because they're not far from me right now, but they're, you know, zooming through Blue Hill or whatever. So it's amazing technology. So, um, well, welcome everybody. And as I said, it's uh, great to be here and to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking to you about winter ecology. And um, I will, uh, well, let me just uh, start out by uh, sort of setting the stage. In the interest of time, I've had to think about how I can uh, present what I think to be, um, uh, what I consider to be amazing, amazing adaptations to the winter environment. But in doing so, I just, we don't have the time. So I've arranged this and I hope I can pull it off this way where I'll be focusing on uh, different species that serve as sort of representative animals for different types of organisms. And hopefully that'll come through as to why I um, did it that way that they can be symbolic for a number of other species that, that are similar to them in their habits and their body size and things like that. And the other thing is I'll mention that um, my focus will be on terrestrial habitats and freshwater habitats and not marine habitats. I'm not a marine person. I, um, you know, as maybe the, uh, my uh, background focus uh, intimated that I'm more interested in terrestrial and freshwater uh, systems and organisms. Um, so, and, you know, with this carrying the title of winter ecology, that does involve or integrate plants, but I won't be talking about plants. I'm an animal, I'm an animal person. Uh, it's my background and my interest. Uh, not to say that they aren't important. They're very important, but uh, we won't cover them tonight. Um, and then the other thing I'll mention is that a lot of what I'll talk about uh, this afternoon or this evening uh, is derived from this course that I've taught at College of the Atlantic since 1994, the year after I came to the college, that's called Winter Ecology. 
And uh, I grew into winter ecology. I had no training in it uh, in graduate school or as an undergraduate, no winter ecology course existed where I went to school. But it was my interest in temperatures, extreme temperatures, both very cold and very hot, that drew me to it. And coming to a college in Northern Maine, I thought, what the heck, I'm going to go for it and build this course and call it winter ecology. And it was through those years that, um, and uh, taking um, many, many cohorts of students out into the field that my students, through their curiosity and questions, you know, made me a better teacher of winter ecology because I was put in a position where I had to answer their questions. And a lot of the questions, given the nature of this course, where we spend a significant amount of time in the field, comes from what we observe in the field. So, so tonight is, as I said, a sort of a distillation of, of my uh, coming of age into winter ecology by way of this course. And in uh, one of the early years of the course is there was a student who was always probing with her questions and curiosity who, is uh, hopefully familiar to a number of you over at the Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And I don't know, Sandy, if you're tuning in, there you are from the early years. And I don't know if you remember any of your classmates from, from that year. This was the least embarrassing picture that I had of Sandy that I included. Just, I you know, didn't, want to, uh, didn't want to do that to her if indeed she's tuning in. All right, so I'm gonna start off by talking not about animals right off the bat, but I'm gonna talk about snow because snow is a very important part of the winter landscape. We can have winter without snow and it'll still be winter because winter can also be defined as a season of, of uh, resource deprivation, just lacking of food for the organisms that remain resident in Northern latitudes or high latitudes. It can be a definition of winter and not necessarily a season when there is snow. But snow indeed is often synonymous with winter. And, and, it, and when it is here, it plays a really important uh, role in, in the ecology of the organisms that, um, that are resident. So um, let me just, I'm just, and a lot of this is more sort of physical uh, than it is biological. Um, but I just wanna run through this just to give you a, a sort of framework for how, what this can mean for organisms. And, um, and snow comes about when it is the convergence of water vapor in the atmosphere and temperatures that are low enough that uh, prompts water vapor to condense into a solid form, ice crystals, we call them snow crystals, but they're ice crystals. And then the third component is a speck of dust or a speck of dirt. Snow cannot form in the atmosphere unless there is some particle of something to attach to. And it is usually dirt. A lot of it now is industrial dirt because of our activities, but we also think that it is sand blown up from the Sahara Desert that makes its way up into the upper atmosphere and um, water vapor finds that speck of dust and condenses on it. So it's impossible for us to see that when snow is falling, but for every snow crystal or, um, uh, that falls out of the sky, there is a speck of dust that comes with that snowflake or snow crystal. And every once in a while, things will happen on the ground that gives us sort of insight that what is happening up in the sky, because here's a picture I took years ago where there were these seeds that had fallen on a frozen river and very close to the ice cover was an open lead of groundwater. And that particular night, it was very cold. And what had happened was is that water vapor from that open lead was evaporating uh, and saturating the air right above the frozen river. And these seeds served as that nucleating sort of speck of dust and created this ice or snow crystal on land. And we also see this in other ways too, wherever there is water that's usually ground seep or groundwater that uh, remains frozen, unfrozen rather, because it's usually at around you know, 50 degrees or so Fahrenheit, and the air is cold enough, whenever there is some kind of physical structure that allows the water vapor to get condensed into solid form, you get these snow crystals. Now, when it starts taking this form, it has a name for it. We call it hoarfrost. Um, and not, not, you know, land snow crystals or whatever. Now there's another way I wanted to show you just because it's curious and interesting where 
uh, groundwater can freeze, but it doesn't form those ice crystals because remember what's happening there is that the groundwater is giving rise to water vapor, then the water vapor is condensing onto something. Here's where you have a situation where there will be porous soil, you see kind of sandy porous soil, and then there's groundwater right underneath it that is liquid, and then the air temperature above that soil is below freezing. And what will happen then is that the liquid water will freeze into ice and it creates, they, they, these have different names, but some people call it needle ice or some people call it ice pillars, but it is, it, 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 um, it uh, grows from the bottom up and you can see these sort of tips here where they sort of, you know, um, sort of trail off. And if the conditions stay right where cold temperatures, no wind, and groundwater, they'll grow and, you know, sort of using the uh, student holding this to scale. This is probably close to, I think, a foot tall. And I, I you know, it has no bearing on the ecology of animals. It's just neat to, when, you, when you see that. Although it does disrupt soil. It's thought to uh, maybe uh, uh, promote uh, erosion or turning over the soil. All right. So back to snow that falls from the sky, one of the things is that as soon as snow falls onto land, it starts to change, it starts to undergo metamorphosis. And there's two different, very important types of metamorphosis that happen that have uh, implications for animals that um, are in the winter environment. So one type of metamorphosis is the strengthening of the snowpack. It's called constructive metamorphosis. And it's the same type of physical change in snow that uh, happens when you make a snowball. Uh, the snow crystals are physically coming closer and closer together, uh, removing any air space that would have been between individual snow crystals. And just simply the individual water molecules start latching uh, onto one another and increasing the uh, mechanical strength of it. And you can see this as this snow you know, slides off a rooftop, but it doesn't fall off because of the mechanical strength uh, from this point to this point. The other way you can see this is if the snow persists long enough out into the woods, and again, if conditions are right where it isn't windy, where snow can fall off a branch but not break. You get these what I call snow scarves or snow ribbons. Here's one that I found once, and here's one that has kind of a corkscrew shape to it. So there's no branch in the middle of this keeping it together. It's just that mechanical strength that allows it to retain that form and not fall to the ground. Now on land, one of the things that happens with this constructive metamorphosis is that snow creeps. It can slide over the ledge or the edge of a, of a boulder or a fallen log like it does off a roof, and it can create these overhangs. And small mammals that come to the surface of a snowpack every so often make use of these. It keeps them from being out in the open, that it creates these, um, these uh, temporary covers for them or overhangs for them to scurry on top of the snow to do whatever had brought them up to the top um, in the first place and to remain, um, as I said, uh, 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 as cryptic as possible while being on the surface. And I'll just show you this because another way that snow can compact is that, uh, I'll go back to this last slide, often what facilitates this is wind, wind blowing and physically pushing snow together. But as I mentioned with a snowball, uh, that just packing it, just pressure of bringing snow together can cause the same type of change. And for an animal to step on a snowpack, it's doing the same thing as our hands making a snowball where it can compact the snow crystals together. So this is a picture of a fox that at one point walked on the snowpack and the weight of the fox is right here where its paw um, stepped on this small piece of snow, but all the other snow did not undergo the metamorphosis. And what happened over time was maybe a combination of some melt from the sun or wind blew it away. And again, when you're out in the woods long enough, you can see this. And I think the type of winter we're having, we should, you should be able to see this toward later in the winter when the snow starts melting away. But you can see where the fox walked. It's like these pedestals that are left behind. Oops, sorry. 
um, because of the different properties of the snow. The snow is more compact, so it doesn't melt as fast as the uh, looser snow around it. And here's another picture that I got of a fox that walked on a frozen river once when it was covered with snow and did the same thing. And then the wind obviously blew the other snow, um, surrounding snow away, but left these sort of trailing foot pedestals. All right, so the second type of metamorphosis that snow can undergo is called destructive metamorphosis. And by you know, implication of the name of the adjective destructive is that, is that the snowpack starts to destroy, but the snowpack only starts to fall apart at the bottom. And uh, what happens is that, uh, well, uh, the physics of this can get a little detailed and just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skim over that, but if anybody's interested and we have time at the end, I can talk about it. But in essence, what happens is, is that individual snow crystals uh, migrate from the bottom of the snowpack and get redeposited on the top. And that's driven by a temperature difference where you have cold, air overlying a snowpack and the warmth from the ground is going to make the bottom of the snowpack warmer than the top. And that temperature differential drives, as I said, snow from the bottom to be redeposited at the top. And as a result, you get these cavities opening up because you have fewer water molecules or fewer snow crystals at the bottom. And it creates these crumbly layers that, and this is referred to as the subnivian environment. And small mammals thrive, along with insects, small mammals thrive in the subnivian environment. It can create open areas for them to live in throughout the winter, as long as the snowpack uh, persists, and to be insulated from the overlying cold air and basically be pretty cushy down there. Um, and uh, you can see here in this picture that I took this after we had a decent snowpack one year, and then we had a February thaw and it removed most of the snow, but you can see the trails of the small mammals that were living in that subnivian environment prior to the melting of the snow. This is a picture I took out in, um, in the Tetons years ago, when a snowpack is deep enough like Western states get, especially up in higher elevations, where the snowpack persists for a long, long time, much longer than here in the East, and uh, well into May, that the subnivian can really open up and the temperature differential be such that flowers start not only germinating, but bloom in the subnivian environment prior to the snow melting away. Again, we, I rarely see this here. The closest thing that we get is skunk cabbage in the, in the early spring through their metabolic heat starting to poke through snow. But this is these globe flowers are not generating any, any metabolic heat. It's just that the, it was cavernous and warm enough down there for them to be able to bloom. All right. Oops. Another property of snow is that, not surprisingly, it's highly reflective. And I mention that because snow reflects nearly all of the shortwave visible spectrum that comes from the sun. And as a result, it doesn't absorb any of that heat. So once a snowpack settles onto the ground, it creates a sort of feedback loop where it will stay cold or it will make the local conditions even colder that allows the snowpack to persist that then allows the subnivian environment to persist longer for those animals that uh, exploit that in the winter time. And it's because of its highly reflective properties of snow. And this is when I was out in the Tetons and I took that picture at some point, but I took this picture at two o'clock in the morning. I, back in the day when I would cross country ski at two o'clock in the morning, I was out with some friends and I did not have a tripod. There was a full moon behind me and you can just see how reflective snow is. But at the same time, snow is really good at absorbing heat. So it reflects shortwave visible light, 
but the heat that's given off by terrestrial objects and the heat that's given off by us, snow is really good sort of paradoxically at absorbing heat and releasing heat at night. And you can see here this oak leaf, how over time the sun has heated up this leaf and the leaf is starting, has, has then gives off heat. And you can see how because of the heat had is melted into the snowpack and, and along the way the melt is the perfect outline of the oak leaf as it sinks down in. All right. All right, so on to some of the animals that are resident species here in Maine, along the coast of Maine. And you know, um, the other day I sort of had a moment of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I need to find stock photos of a lot of these animal tracks in the snow to show you all. Um, as I make my points about the animals. And I do have some pictures of, of the animals that made the tracks that I'm gonna show you that I took, but I resisted. I sort of caught myself and I resist. I said, you know something I'm not because in the winter time, um, as is the case for most of the year, seeing an animal in the winter landscape is a special moment. You just don't see animals that often, period. But when you do out into the wild, it's really special, and, um, and it, but in the wintertime, you see their tracks. And I always tell my students, when you see animal tracks in the snow, you should equate that with seeing the animal. Uh, because oftentimes, the way the animals have left the tracks and, and depending on the, the snow conditions, you can make sense of what the animal is doing. I love this quote that Edward Way Teal um, had in one of his readings where you can read it that you know the snow is filled with the gossip of the night so there, it can't it can't keep any secrets and you're just looking at the snow re reveals a lot about what happened the night before for example looking at this these are tracks of a mink that for some reason you can see this mink is obsessed with this this tree stump and i think what it was doing it was marking its territory but regardless of where the tracks were coming and going, it would always stop here and then sort of make a right turn and head that way. And, and looking at that, again, you, you know, you're, you're making an assumption or hypothesizing, but it's, I think it's a reasonable one that for some reason, this physical object was really important to that mink. So I'm gonna talk about big mammals uh, initially, and I'm gonna show you some tracks of and I don't have pictures of the animals that made the tracks, but I'm doing so by um, talking about um, mammals and birds as big mammals or small mammals, big birds or small birds, because I really, one of the sort of take home messages of this evening in terms of the science is that uh, what an animal does in the winter time and how, they, how it copes and what adaptations it has to make it through the winter both in terms of cold temperatures and um, scarcity of food has a lot, and some people would argue, all to do with its body size. How big or how small it is plays a huge, huge role in what we see in animal adaptations to the winter environment. And in short, I'll tell you that the bigger an animal gets, and again, there's physics behind this that I'd be happy to talk about it, you know, some, uh, you know, if, you know, at the end um, or some other time, if you want to contact me by email, the bigger an animal gets, the less of itself is exposed to the winter environment. Now it's a big animal, but on a per mass basis, there's less of its surface. There's less of itself exposed to cold temperatures and to wind. And because of that, just by if you all else being equal, not considering insulation, just by being big, animals are more buffered or insulated from the winter environment um, compared to a small animal. And that certainly is the case of coyote for the coyotes. It's also the case of bobcats. This is track of a bobcat um, that I took uh, last winter. These are bigish mammals. Now, add on the fact that in the wintertime, they uh, put on a thick winter coat and what and the best way to talk about their uh, winter adaptations is is that I've already told you what they do 
They're big, they're evolutionarily big, and they put on a winter coat and they're adept at finding food, either by hunting it down, bobcats or coyotes, you know, are notorious for being effective scavengers. And that's it, you know, and, and in fact, it's kind of boring to talk about these big mammals. It's, they're, it's, um, it, it, it's much more interesting, you'll hopefully see, to consider how small mammals make it through the winter. All right, staying with some tracks and uh, just showing you, and I think those of you tuning in, I, you know, I suspect uh, enjoy the winter environment and, and see tracks like this. So anytime you see tracks that end at a tree, you can be almost guaranteed you're looking at the tracks of a species of squirrel. Around here in the woods, usually a, you know, almost guaranteed to be a red squirrel, sort of like on the, you know, um, uh, border of a town and the woods could be a gray squirrel. But a squirrel's hopping from obviously the tree trunks and scurrying across the uh, surface of the snow from tree to tree. Red squirrels are a smallish mammal. Um, I, don't con I won't consider them to be small mammals. Small mammals, and I'll get to them in a second, is really the realm of mice and voles and shrews. But obviously, great uh, red squirrels are smaller than coyotes and, and bobcats. Um, these are the probably the most visible mammal in the winter time. Sure, anybody who's been out, you see and you certainly hear red squirrels. Red squirrels are tenacious. When it comes to winter, red squirrels are in, they they just they they stare winter in the eye and just beat it down. They are incredibly, that's the best way to describe them, incredibly tenacious. They're, they're active. It's only the coldest temperatures and the winter that we've had here along the coast of Maine, we have not got, we have not gotten air temperatures that would drive red squirrels to find a cavity in a tree or a burrow and hunker down until that, that deep cold passes. So it is really only the deep, deep cold that will cause them to either go into an underground burrow or as I said, into a tree cavity and wait that out. They don't hibernate, they just kind of wait it out. But um, other than that, they are active and they're actively finding food that they've cached. And you can see here the diggings of pine cones that they've cached in the fall and they're scurrying about. Um, oftentimes, if it isn't a good year for pine cones, they're forced to feed on winter buds and red squirrels are also notorious for forgetting where their caches of, of, of the uh, pine cones are. And so they just do a lot of scurrying about. They also put on for their size, a thick winter coat that keeps them from um, uh, uh, at least feeling temperatures that would prompt them to start losing heat. I guess one of the, uh, well, I'll talk about that in just a little bit, sorry, yeah. All right, so onto small mammals. These are the tracks of a deer mouse or a, a white-footed mouse. I don't know the species, but, and I don't have anything for scale. So it could appear to be like the tracks of a kangaroo, but they're not, they're of a deer mouse that on the surface, they are very interested in spending as little time on the surface as possible. So they'll rear up on their hind legs and they'll be bipedal. And here is the tail drag in between hops. All right, so this is a picture of a uh, meadow vole, not a live one. It's actually in one of our exhibits here at the uh, Natural History Museum at COA. I don't have a picture of a deer mouse or a meadow vole or a shrew live one out in the winter landscape that's on my bucket list. Uh, but I wanted to show you uh, a picture to emphasize uh, a, um, an a, uh, evolutionary adaptation to survive in the winter that is not unique to small mammals, but it plays a, uh, a, a uh, overriding role in their survival more so than in sort of medium sized mammals like red squirrels or large mammals like bobcats and, uh, and coyotes here in the east. And it has to do with specialized tissue that sits right between their shoulder blades, their scapula. And I just put this little sort of burst of red here to uh, symbolize this tissue that is called brown adipose tissue, uh, BAT, the acronym B-A-T, or brown fat. This is tissue that's 
sort of commonly called heater tissue. They synthesize it, these small mammals, all mammals do, but especially small mammals, they synthesize it in the fall and they use it in the winter and it is heater tissue. Its only function is to generate metabolic heat. So there are rich fat deposits and then there is the metabolic machinery to break that fat down and turn it into heat and to dissipate that heat. And it sits right between the shoulder blades, also at the base of the brain. So we think the positioning there is there because it's important to keep the brain warm and it's important to keep the core warm more so than the periphery. And heat does indeed dissipate out, um, but it's, it's centralized here right at the base of the brain. Now they don't have an endless supply of this. So it, as I said, it's synthesized in the fall and then that's what they have for the winter. So they can deplete it in the winter time. And if they do, they then are in dire straits. Because they're small, going back to body size, more of their body is exposed to the winter environment than a bigger mammal. So they rely much more heavily than larger mammals on this heater tissue to stay warm by virtue of being small. They also, as I mentioned earlier, make generous use of the subnivian environment. They just use that, that as a huge insulative down blanket, if you will, to avoid really cold temperatures. Having said that, they do come to the surface and their tracks are evidence that they do come to the surface. People don't really know why they do, why they come to the surface. Some people think that they need to get out of the subnivian to breathe, that there's a buildup of CO2 and that they may need just to come up and sort of flush themselves out of the CO2 um, before they go back down. By the way, we have brown fat. We're born with brown fat. As babies, we have it, and it helps us keep ourselves warm as we are you know, fresh out of the womb. It was long thought that we then lose it as we grow up, but in the time that I've been teaching winter ecology, more and more evidence accumulated um, to, um, um, to support the fact that as adults, humans have brown fat. And we do, what do we use it for? You know, I guess heater tissue, I, I, you can, the new, it seems like every winter, the New York Times has an article about brown fat in adult humans, implicating it for um, things related to obesity or maybe to uh, keeping us warm. Um, and maybe, and also recent articles about how there's research afoot to think about converting white fat which is you know, the sort of regular white fat that we know and love and converting that to brown fat that can then just be burned as, um, as a heater tissue. But anyway, I'm going astray here. All right, river otters. Um, I will um, focus on them for a few minutes to talk about mammals that go into the water in the winter time. This perhaps is the most maybe threatening a scenario for us to you know, think about falling into water in the winter time. Um, and just you know, for a second, not um, implicating drowning, not getting to the surface, but just simply getting wet with water and then climbing up out of the water and in cold you know, temperatures that could be at or below the freezing point of water and hypothermia quickly settling in, quickly settling in. Yet we have otters, we have mink, we have muskrat that readily dive in and out of the water um, during the winter and seem no worse for the wear. And how do they do that? Well, in the case of river otters, it is their fur that allows them to move in and out of water. In the wintertime, river otters sort of switch behaviors in terms of foraging where they're much more nomadic. In the wintertime, they are forced to, for the most part, go after fish. Uh, in the, in the non-winter months, they have a wider, more varied diet of freshwater clams and, uh, and frogs and probably even small turtles. But in the wintertime, though that prey base uh, tends to disappear, become much more um, um, much more uh, scattered. 
and they focus more on catching fish. And because of that, they're moving from one water body to the next in search of fish in and out of water. And it's their fur that allows them to move on land for a while. And seeing otter tracks on land are the most fun tracks that you can see as this otter is, you know, loping as they, you know, prone to do if they really want to make time. And here you can see the impression of their heavy tail that they leave in between lopes and their hind legs fall right into the depression that's made by their front legs. And of course they love to slide too and not always downhill. This picture was taken, you can see the, the uh, side of the uh, stream was flat and I think they're doing it because it's fun. But what they're doing is in search of these open leads that they go, can go into the water in, in search of, 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 um, of fish. And their fur is incredibly dense, but more so than that is that with a combination of oils that they secrete, and they're not extensive groomers like other semi-aquatic mammals. For example, muskrats are, are sort of nonstop groomers um, in the wintertime, but, uh, but otters less so. They roll in the snow, but the thing it is is that they their behaviors allow them to, uh, to disperse the oil and allows then their hair to trap air between their skin and the outside of the fur. So that's what they're after, trapping air between, uh, uh, between their you know, exposed skin and the water, much like what a dry suit does. Otters in the wintertime are often forced to seek out beaver impoundments because it's beavers that can keep open leads in the ice that allow otters to go in the water. And it's the activity of beavers as they move in and out of their lodge to forage underwater that can keep open leads um, despite cold temperatures. Now here are, here's a picture that you can see that this open area just recently froze because you can see the sort of the chunks of ice um, that I just took this picture this morning and we had kind of warmish rain the other day, which this was open and this just froze over. Uh, but here's where there's no snow, but you can see where the beaver are coming and going from their underwater um, entrance and exit by virtue of all these air bubbles that are trapped in the ice. Um, it's probably a combination of beavers exhaling some air, air and also just moving the water around and probably disrupting the sediment and, and methane bubbles bubbling up. But uh, you can see they're sort of stacked here like pancakes as the ice gets progressively colder. But as I said, it's the movement of the water by way of the beavers that can keep open leads uh, and otters depend on those. Uh, just back to beaver for a second. Beaver venture into the water. Um, they are bigger than otters. They're really hefty uh, mammals, but they rely more on behavior than any superior insulation um, uh, compared to otters. And you know, beavers live in familial colonies in the lodge. So we think when they're in the lodge, out of the water, it's the, bod the collective body heat of all the family members that keep them warm and that they don't venture into the water that far to feed because they, studies have shown that they do become fairly, uh, uh, or hypothermic in fairly more rapid fashion than what you would think they would given their body size and their, their apparent insulation. Um, and they behaviorally sort of hedge their bets by caching food in the fall and relying on that cached food, which are, you know, the uh, buds and the, and the vegetation that they, that they wedge down into the uh, bottom sediment and, and then that gets frozen in place and, uh, and feed on that for, uh, for the winter. They also, we think, have a reduced metabolism that their feeding rates go down. So um, as I said, it's more behaviorally than it is morphologically or physiologically um, uh, compared to the otter. All right, another large mammal deer, white-tailed deer, Again, a really prominent, visible part of the winter landscape here. And I um, want to focus on how their behavior and ecology is really dependent on the snow depth over the course of the winter. So deer, having the long legs that they do, are 
pretty much impervious to thin snowpacks. They can go wherever they please. Uh, but at some point, the snow can get deep enough that it starts to create drag. And you can see that when you're out where deer will, bec again, because of their long legs and their hoofs, will sort of plunge right into the snowpack. But whenever you see hoof drag in between individual um, uh, depressions created by their hoofs and their legs, that's an indication that the deer are starting to expend more energy than what they would like. Because with each lifting of the foot and then the foot encountering drag by way of the ever deepening snow, that's more energy expended per stride compared to a, a, a thinner snowpack. And at some point, deer then start to yard up or deer start to alter their, their uh, movement behaviors where they start packing down a trail and then all the deer will use that one trail instead of basically breaking trail um, to go to um, any place that, uh, uh, that they would like to because of forage, but behaviorally they're now constrained to these packed down trails because it lessens their energy expenditure. And you can see, oops, you can see here, took this picture years ago up in the north of Old Town, and I wish I had something for scale, but the snow was, was waist high, if not a little bit deeper. But this is a deer trail. You can see how it's packed down. It looks like a snowmobile went through there. And no deer, you know, offshoots here because of the depth of the snow. And at some point, deer will simply bed down. If snow gets deep enough, now the snow here isn't that deep. Deer, deer will bed down to soak up the rays to bask in the sun, but also deer in really deep snowpacks will stop moving even in those well-worn trails and just bed down and just sit in the snow and live off their fat. And again, you think that it's so counterintuitive. Why would they do that? Why would they plop their bodies down in the cold snow and, uh, and you know that would lower their body temperature? Well, it doesn't, they're big animals and the snow actually serves as an insulation they're much more um, threatened by standing up and their thin legs that, are, that have less fur on it than their back would be subject to cooling down. So they, they said they plop down in the snow and they live off their fat. All right, here's a picture that I took recently where a deer was walking on an, a, a, a pond. And again, it was during a, a, a recent thaw and you can see where its hoof marks and the, and, the, uh, and the hoof drag was then frozen in place. Deer, this is one of the things I've read, tried to read about it and I don't know, there's probably information out there. Why deer go out on a frozen lake or a pond is, is beyond me, given the type of, of legs and, and feet that they have, uh, is, uh, puts them in an incredibly you know, uh, 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 perilous situation. There's no other way to say that. If they are on solid ice, they are very apt to slip and they can't get up. And this picture I show you here, I took on a local pond a number of years ago where a deer for whatever reason did and obviously could not get out of that situation and became um, food for coyotes. All right, how many doing on time? Oh, I got a, a soup. Um, all right, these are the tracks of wild turkey and the time that I've been here teaching winter ecology, I've been, I have seen them more and more over the years. Why, we have a pretty healthy population of wild turkeys on Mount Desert Island. Wild turkeys are big birds and like big mammals and especially also given their feathers, they are pretty impervious to cold temperatures. They are, um, more impacted by deep snow that impacts their ability to sort of, you know, scrounge uh, or scrape at the snow to get at um, to get at browse. When that happens, they roost. They roost at night, but if a snow will come along and really increase the snowpack, they'll wait it out up in the branches and can go. I read reports of as long as 14 days of roosting um, until the snow allows them to, uh, to search for food. And again, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're big birds and have less of themselves exposed to the, 
cold temperatures and can store the fat. I'll just show you a couple other pictures rather quickly here in the interest of time. Um, this is the snow imprint of another big bird <clears throat> that we have here as a winter resident, but not a year round resident. And those are snowy owls that come down from the high Arctic uh, that um, over the years, we tend to get more winter migrants down here than others. Um, one year we had a particularly flush year and this was taken out near the Trenton airport where there were reports of snowy owls out there because the airport runway is very reminiscent of their open tundra um, uh, where they migrate from. And while I was out there getting this picture of this bird perched on this utility pole, I thought I spooked it by getting um, closer perhaps than what I should have, but I didn't because the bird saw this meadow vole, swooped down, picked it up, and then came back and just perched right where it was and, and uh, proceeded to eat it. These birds are big. They're well insulated. They don't get cold in the winter time. The only other endothermic animal that um, rivals the ability of snowy owls to not get cold are Arctic foxes. Arctic foxes and snowy owls, to the best of my knowledge, we have yet experimentally uh, been able to find an air temperature where they start to lose heat. And I think we have stopped at minus 40 degrees centigrade or Celsius um, at those experimental temperatures. They're just so built for the cold. All right, rough grouse, another sort of fairly big bird um, that uh, just show you a, uh, a, um, a uh, adaptation that they have that's behavioral, not physiological because they're well you know, suited for the cold with their feathers, but they can augment their feather insulation by at night, uh, diving down into the snowpack and roosting, if you will, or waiting out the night in the snow. And you can see the little pile of grouse poop right here. And so again, they're using the snow and the insulative properties of it as sort of extra insulation. And then in the morning, they'll sort of dust themselves off of the snow, walk away, and then take flight. And then start the day um, in the trees, picking usually you know winter buds. But for my money, between mammals and, and birds, small birds are the champions of making it through the winter. This northern junco is just an example of a small bird that uh, we have here in the winter time. But our state bird, the chickadee, is often heralded as the sort of champion of winter, um, of winter survival, uh, uh, survivorship. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that, and this is now known in other birds, but this was first discovered in chickadees, is that in the fall, chickadees brains enlarge, specifically the hippocampus. It's the region of our brains and their brains that is involved with short-term memory and spatial uh, recognition. So they put on additional neurons in the fall and allows them to remember where food is in the winter time. And then in the spring, those neurons um, degrade away. So it's a seasonal response. So chickadees are amazing at finding food and remembering where it is. Other birds recognize that and they follow chickadees around um, uh, to, uh, for the chickadee to locate their food. Chickadees are also extremely good at making it through the night because they'll lower their body temperature. At night, they'll fight the cold a little bit less by lowering their body temperature and going into a fairly shallow state of hypothermia, if you will. And then in the morning, they, um, they uh, increase their metabolism and increase their body temperature to the active state, which is close to 40 degrees C. They do not have brown fat like small mammals. They just, so how do they make it through the night without freezing to death? They shiver. Small birds shiver the winter away. All day, they forage to build up fat reserves that they then use those fat reserves to shiver all night long. They wake up in the morning, having made it through the night, start feeding to lay down the fat so that they have fat to shiver the, 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 that night. That is their life in the wintertime eating and shivering. And 
they're successful at it. It's amazing. It's amazing that they can make it through, you know, some really deep cold nights. Here's a picture of the chickadee feeding during the day. All right, a couple other, and I know, oh gosh, I may, okay, I'll sort of judge my time here so that we can have time for questions. Um, so switching to invertebrates for a minute um, and staying with amazing adaptations. I hate to sound like one of those people on a cable channel for kids with, with, uh, uh, for, with animal stories. Um, but there are instances where there are winter resident um, invertebrates that survive the winter because they are freeze intolerant. They, they're able to super cool. They synthesize specific molecules in their body that lower their freezing point. So air temperatures can drop way below freezing, but they're not going to freeze because they have, in essence, antifreeze that they synthesize in the wintertime and, re and, and are then they're referred to as freeze intolerant, such as this fishing spider. Um, this is a picture of a dried up uh, goldenrod stem. And these bumps here are galls that are uh, created by the plant in response to a maggot or a larva that was an egg was laid in there in the fall by a fly, the goldenrod fly, I think it's called. And the egg hatches out, and then the larva will overwinter above the snowpack, uh, growing and maturing to fly out in the spring. So it is exposed to cold temperatures that can be low enough and often are that are below the freezing point of water. And these larvae are not freeze intolerant. They do not make chemicals that prevent them from freezing. In fact, they synthesize molecules that promote freezing. They're freeze tolerant species. Now you say, well, it's an insect. Insects can do everything. That's why they're everywhere. And that's why they're so numerous. But uh, here's the just the larva right there. But freeze tolerance has also evolved in some vertebrates. This is a picture of a gray tree frog that a former student sent to me when he was hiking in the green mountains of Vermont in the wintertime. And this gray tree frog must have fallen out of a tree and landed on the snow. And here it is. It's not dead. It's frozen. So gray tree frogs freeze in the wintertime when air temperatures get below freezing. Spring peepers freeze in the wintertime. So do wood frogs. Wood frogs don't go into water in the wintertime. They burrow down into the leaf litter. But if air temperatures get low enough and their uh, snow cover is thin, then they'll be in environmental conditions where it will promote freezing of water in their body. A number of years ago, I collected a wood frog in the fall and I put it through the proper um, experimental um, uh, protocol that would simulate fall settling in where temperatures got increasingly, or I should say decreasingly lower. And then I experimentally froze it. So these are just a series of pictures that I took one, the, as the frog was thawing out and you can see that its skin is wrinkly here. Ice is just starting to thaw out here. It's, it's wrinkly because all the water is tied up as ice, but I'm just gonna run through here that after a number of minutes, it started to regain its posture. And you can see now it's starting to have use of its legs. And here it is with its eyes open. This took about 90 minutes um, to do this. And I'm showing you this, but also telling you, please, 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 if you find a wood frog in the summertime, do not take it home and put it in your freezer. It will die. It needs to go through sort of a conditioning of the fall to be able to promote freeze tolerance in its body. Amazing, amazing to think that animals can freeze in the wintertime and then thaw out. So I just want to show you a couple of last pictures of life under ice. And I think I'll probably just in the interest of time, skip over a couple videos, um, which I'll just um, go to this. So one of the things about life in water under ice is that it's not so much the cold temperature, because when you think about it, like water is liquid, so it's got to be above the freezing point of water but it's more about access to oxygen. When a lake or a pond is capped, then it obviously is cut off from atmospheric oxygen that can diffuse into the water. But clearly animals are doing something about that. That's why you can ice fish in the wintertime because species of fish like salmon and, and trout, which are high oxygen demanding species, are able to obviously be very active 
and searching for prey in the, in the, in the wintertime. And their body acclimates to that. Their body acclimates to the cold temperatures. And so they, water can be at almost the freezing point of, of water, almost making ice, but they, it's, it's not the cold, it is, it is the availability of oxygen. So if you have winter care, kill of fish, it's because of the prolonged winter, um, keeping the ice longer into the early spring that uh, depletes oxygen enough that the, they just run out of oxygen, not, not that they're just exposed to the cold um, uh, for prolonged periods of time. And I'm just going to show you this quick video. I can't resist. Now fish have gills that allow them to extract dissolved oxygen from the water, but there are other vertebrates under the water, I should say under the ice in the winter time that don't have gills, that have lungs like we do, like painted turtles, yet they can persist under the ice. And the only word that I can use here is amazing because what do turtles do? Do they somehow extract dissolved oxygen from the water? And the answer is a resounding no, they don't. And the answer is they just don't breathe over the course of the winter. If ice is capping the lake or pond that they are in for a solid four months, they do not breathe. They do not take a breath of air for four months. Yet they will do this. They're not comatose. They're not immobile. They are just very adept at generating energy without the use of oxygen. I could go into the details of that and again at another time. And oh, I'm just gonna move through here. Um, and just these last couple of slides I wanna show you because I'm often asked about climate change and winter and what do I make of it? And, um, and I don't wanna end on a down note. And, and I certainly don't wanna spend time talking about um, climate change and the loss of winter in large part because I'm not a climate scientist and, and the jury is still out as to what is going to happen. But one thing I do know is that we are getting winters that are much more variable. They're always variable on the coast of Maine, but they're much more variable. So I think conditions where you get falls and then freezes again is what I am seeing more of. And that can create havoc, it really can. And you think, okay, well, the warming actually eases the thermal stress of all these animals. They're, they don't have to confront the cold, but it's the variability that is, that is I think, really um, potentially threatening. And a couple of years ago, we had a major fall and then freeze. And you could see how this uh, giant water bug that was swimming around, obviously, in liquid water that froze it in its tracks. And here is a, a mouse that obviously was, I got to think was walking on the surface of, the, of a, what was probably maybe slushy water. And then there was a cold snap that came in and in a hurry, just you know, stopped this mouse in its tracks. So um, I, I don't know, do I, it's almost five o'clock. Can I show this last little slideshow bit? Okay. So I want to end on an up note because I, and I'm assuming that everybody here today is tuning in and then I'm sort of preaching to converted that, you know, winter, winter puts us as human beings on notice because we're a subtropical species in terms of our evolutionary origins. And because of that, many people high quote unquote hibernate in the winter time, just don't go outside. And then their perceptions are that all other animals that can't migrate also hibernate but they don't. Very few animals in Maine truly hibernate. Uh, jumping mice hibernate. Um, little brown bats that are resident here will uh, hibernate. And woodchucks or groundhogs are true hibernators. Uh, chipmunks are sort of restless hibernators, but all other animals that are resident here in, this, in the wintertime are active. It's us that retreats to our homes and we quote unquote hibernate. And so sort of my take home message is, and I, I probably don't have to tell you this, is that I, that to me, winter is a binary season. You either love it or you either, I don't wanna say hate it, but I guess tolerate it. 
But for me, embracing winter is a way for us. And when you do so sort of mentally and physically by layering up, it allows you to stop thinking about yourself, your own survival, and allows you to start looking outwardly and thinking about the survival of those animals that are around you. And when you do so, I think Bern Heinrich, who has written a book about winter adaptations, puts it really well where he, to quote him, says that looking at the winter ad adaptations of the animals allows you to imagine the unimaginable. Like freezing solid or having like specialized heater tissue or, or making proteins that allow you to sort of drop your freezing point. Can't do any of that up any of that, but yet evolution has led to those types of adaptations and other lineages of animals. And the other thing that being out in the winter environment when you accept it allows you to do is to step back and just realize how sublime a season winter is. So I know we've been all staring at a lot of computer screens uh, this winter, including this evening. And, um, and I'm a minute past my, my you know, uh, uh, deadline here, but I want to end with um, some pictures that I've taken over the years and put to some music because in all the science that I do, I always, always, even with students, take the time to sort of step back and just soak it up. And, and hopefully this slideshow is, will be a nice segue if we have time to take questions um, to entertain those. And I just don't end, you know, abruptly um, with the science to sort of let you take this in. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish I could see you all, you know, but anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. That was amazing. And what a beautiful ending. <laughs> we have people in the chat box just saying awesome webinar and I'm smiling and tearing up at the same time. Oh my. <laughs> so thank you. That was really incredible. Oh, you're welcome. We do have some questions in the chat box. Sure. And um, if you're willing to stay just a couple minutes to answer a few. Absolutely, absolutely. We can go through those. And if anyone would like to raise their hand and ask Steve a question directly, feel free to um, click that little yellow hand. And Jake and I will scroll through and ask some of the questions. Um, I, I do see one question here that I can address. It said, I've heard that turtles can respire underwater using anal tissue. Um, and, and Yes, they can. Um, that has been shown in snapping turtles. It's called cloacal pumping, where they pump water in and out of their cloaca or their anus, their equivalent of their anus, and can extract some dissolved oxygen from the water that way. And maybe that happens in painted turtles a little bit. Um, but if, if it does, uh, it, it, um, 
it doesn't provide enough oxygen for all their energetic needs. And they rely, you know, primarily on just the anaerobic, you know, generation of, 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 of energy. But yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Do squirrels have metabolic fat or just the smaller burrowing mammals? Yeah, we all have it. Uh, big and small and medium-sized mammals have that brown fat. It's just that it has a, uh, a, a huge uh, um, influence on the uh, uh, small mammals' uh, thermal biology because of their small size. And I think the best small mammal to uh, talk about for a minute to show you how much they rely on brown fat are hibernating bats. Hibernating bats will, you know, will find a hibernaculum, a you know, cave or you know, whatever, and enter into a true hibernation and rely on that brown fat exclusively to wake up from hibernation. So over the course of the winter, if they're if the, their hibernaculum is disrupted in terms of temperature rises, which we think is happening because of climate change, or if a person would go into a cave that is a major hibernaculum for bats and your body heat raises the air temperature a little bit, bats will start to stir and they're gonna use that brown fat to, um, to fuel their metabolism and, their, and to raise their body temperature a little bit. And if it's just a little bit of stirring that occurs, that can use it up that fat and put them over the edge and they'll die. So they really, we think because of their small size, go in with just enough, but very little reserve to make it, to make it through the winter. They rely on it to wake up from hibernation. And if they don't have enough because they stir a little bit, then they, in essence, never wake up from hibernation and, and will perish. Um, and I see the question, do black bears in, in Maine hibernate? No, no bear is a true hibernator. We still lack a term to describe what bears do. And what I use is winter sleep. They're groggy, their metabolism is depressed a little bit, depressed by meaning that it, their metabolism is lower but they are very much aware of, um, of what's happening outside their den. I'm fortunate to be able to take students um, out with a state wildlife biologist when they check the condition of denning female bears in the winter time. And they have to tranquilize the females. They are checking the conditions of her and any cubs that she may have. And what's interesting is they tell us, and to tell me, to tell the students, don't wear any nylon um, uh, uh, either pants or uh, like a windbreaker, because when you're walking that swish, swish sound that you make, that the bears pick up on that and they equate that with a hunter. So they say, wear, wear wool um, so it doesn't make any sound. And they said, interesting enough, bears have become acclimated to the sound of the internal combustion engine. So if a snowmobile goes by or if they happen to den near a highway, they never get disturbed by the sound of, you know, the white noise of, of engines that are always cranking away in the wintertime, but that swish swiss they key in on and they equate that with a human approaching their den and they'll take off. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. <laughs> yeah. um, Steve, there are a couple of questions further back about turkeys. One yes. of them, when, turkey, when turkeys roost in the winter, do they huddle together for warmth? And the second one is, um, yeah. do turkeys eat buds while roosting in the trees? I see that, yep. I think that they will roost in communally, but I don't think it is necessarily as a way to conserve body heat. Small birds will do that. Uh, we think golden crown kinglets do that. That in the evening, Bert Heinrich has written about this, will go golden crown kinglets will change their they're chirping and will emit a call that they that we think is a cueing other golden, golden crown kinglets to come in and to roost communally overnight um, to conserve body heat. But but um, what I've read is that turkeys are big enough that they're probably roosting together because they you know they flock together um, and, and that it may just be a suitable branch. But um, and 
I'm sure they stay warmer roosting together, but it might be more incidental than deliberate um, relation to a small bird. And do turkeys eat buds while roosting in the trees? That's a good question. My understanding is, is that no, that they're staying in the trees. Well, they roost at night um, and they're not eating them, but also they're roosting in the trees because the, the snowpack is not allowing them to forage effectively. And, uh, but, you know, I think if buds are there, they, they may peck at them. Um, I'm speculating there. Um, and I'm showing my ignorance of, uh, you know, wild turkey winter ecology there. I'll look up, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. I can email you um, so you can transfer, um, pass that on if you like. Thanks, Steve. That would be great. Yes. Um, we, we do have a hand raised, so I could, if, if they intend sure. to raise their hand, I could let them talk, yeah. ask, you your, yeah. ask you their question. Um, the name is E. e. Carl. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Let me just turn on that microphone here. And sometimes the, the raising of the hand is just an accident. Okay. Um, so if that's the case, um, we'll move on. And if you did have a question though, please let us know in the chat box and we'll try and make it happen again. Um, somebody else has their hand up. Janice Riley. You'd like to unmute yourself if that was an intentional hand raise. Hmm. <laughs> Not sure what's going on. Maybe accidental. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe accidental again. Yep. Um, I know Sandy had a question in the chat box, Steve, if you wanted to address hers. Former student, Sandy. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. She's been here the whole time. Yeah. It's in the chat box. Yeah. I can read it to you too. Um, okay. Go ahead. Yep. We have a thick crust of ice up here that will hold up a person. What kind of impact yep. can these conditions have on small mammal populations yep. and on animals that predate small mammals? Yep, yep. Crusty snow is problematic. Um, the thing is, is that right now we have crusty snow and our snowpack isn't that deep. And you know, from the rain and the thaws that we have that I don't think that the subnivian environment has set up this winter. Also, we haven't, and again, you have to, it's, it's sort of seems paradoxical, but we haven't had really deep cold to drive the formation of subnivian. You really need a, a really dramatic temperature gradient between above the snowpack and at the snow ground interface. And we just, you know, we haven't had those cold temperatures. So I think the small mammals this winter are having a really hard time. And the thick crust, if they're below the snowpack, they can't get above it. And, um, and it's also, you know, preventing them from going down. But, you know, with the variable snowpack that we've had, I've noticed that there's lots of sort of holes or cracks um, in the snow, especially where it interfaces with a rock or, or the base of a tree that's probably allowing them access um, uh, in and out of the, of the snow. Um, and on the animals that predate the small mammals, I think, oh, I don't know, it's hard to say. I think that uh, for small mammals, I think what gets them are, um, are, are weasels, the ermine and, you know, and, um, and as well as owls, you know, that are, that are uh, um, feeding on them at night. And I think the weasels, that they're in and out, they're incredibly adept at, you know, finding these small mammals. I mean, you know, they're, the, the, their, their shape is making, you know, they're long and thin and sausage shape, and they're extremely good at, at wedging themselves in, into really small um, um, openings in the snow to go after uh, uh, small mammals. Um, but um, I probably, the crust, to me, the crust is more about the variable conditions that did not allow the subnivian to set up more so than that barrier because, uh, um, uh, because of uh, warmer temperatures. Thanks, Steve. Um, it looked like E. Carl um, put a question in the chat box and okay. he said, is it okay to feed birds, feed in, the birds in the winter? Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's okay to feed wild turkeys. People do. And I think wild, you know, like fish and game departments will, I don't think they, they frown on it the way they do uh, feeding deer. Um, but, um, but the feeding of birds has actually allowed um, a um, migration north of birds to remain winter resident birds because of, of, of access to food in the wintertime, along with more buildings. For example, cardinals now are here year round. And it's known that house finches that are native to uh, the Southern United States are winter residents now in places like Michigan and the Northeast. And that has everything to do with bird feeders and them exploiting the heat of buildings in the winter time to, uh, to uh, make it through the winter. They're not particularly adept at uh, fighting the cold the way chickadees are or juncos are or goldfinches are. Um, they're less cold tolerant, but, uh, but the, but the uh, combination of you know, access to food um, and as I said, and the, and the warmth of heat coming off of buildings allows them to stay uh, year round. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, I combed through the questions. I think we got to most of them, but I do want you to know, I, I don't know if you were scanning through them yourself, but there's a ton of praise here for you and uh, many thanks for the fascinating and intriguing information about the um, winter ecology, which I was so excited about because, you know, as a learning naturalist still, I, I you know, you, you hear and read a lot about spring ecology, but you rarely get to talk about the stuff that the busy stuff that happens in the winter, the important stuff that happens in the winter. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And you know something, I wish I could have done this outside with everybody. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, that's the place to be, but, but this is pretty good too. This is definitely good yep. too. Yep. I, I really, yep. I appreciated yep. the yep. visuals that you yep. provided with the videos. So one thing I could do is if I would have access to this chat is I could go through the questions that I, you know, didn't address, and if I emailed you answers, can this then be distributed to the people? Yes. Who asked them? Okay. I can put it in a follow-up email, um, and I will see. I think I think I can access the chat. I I don't know if I've ever saved it before, but I will work on doing that before yeah. I close out myself, or I'll try and copy and paste. Right. Um, actually, I kind of think yeah. if you save the recording, that the chat has saved as text. I was I told. Right. By more and I just found people. a button too that says save the chat. So I think it will work one way or another. Um, and then Sandy says we would love a live talk next year. So we'll have to um, All right. be in touch with you about that, Steve. <laughs> well. Love to do that. Yep. Hopefully it'll be a very different winter than this year. Yeah. All right. Well, this Great. has been incredible. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. All right. My pleasure. Have a good evening, everybody. Yeah. yeah. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Yes. Thank you all. Okay. And I just leave, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna All right, great. Too. Bye, Steve. All right, bye-bye.